morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for hanging in there. This is uh, hopefully going to be a really good discussion today. Uh, we're going to have some uh, great sharing from some early efforts in two states. And, um, and I think, Barbara, are we going to start with the video? So we're going to go ahead and start with a, a video, video that we want to thank the Youth Transition Funders Group for allowing us to show. Uh, it's a newly produced video, and we thought it would be a great way to kind of kick off the conversation. I'm hearing from the voices of young people. Just growing up, like I was taught not to give up easily, even when it gets hard, because in life there is no easy way out. You've got to make sure that your physical health, your mental health are definitely in check. You have to have a certain level of consciousness and awareness to act appropriately. I feel like you get a bond in a relationship when you're able to talk about your story with someone else who's had a trauma or a messed up situation with being in care. Usually I, I start off by trying to talk to them just to get to know them, see where their mind is at, because I already know that they have this struggle or already going through something they don't want to tell you, you know? I think not having someone there for you forever, like, that's rough. That you know? Up that messes up your head. Hearing from other people always gives me some light and some hope. So I'm willing to share my experience to help someone go through theirs. I've been around so much people, and people always talking about, oh, I could do everything myself. I could do this by myself. No, you can't. Yeah, well, it's been pretty difficult. Um, growing up in a house of six siblings and only my mom, there was a lot of poverty, always poverty. All we cared about was survival and how are we going to make it to see that next morning. Twelve years old, everything changed, but, you know, they took us away. They threw us in um, a group home. They separated me and my brother for, like, the first time because growing up, we was inseparable. And when they separated us, I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to lie, I lost my mind. Growing up in foster care, there's a lot of times that you go through bad situations and stuff, and it can be very discouraging and bring you down and stuff. But the situation that I grew up in was so bad that I just had to try my hardest to overcome it and that I knew that I could rise above it. So I would push myself even harder and harder and harder. Don't let your past hold you back because you have control of your future. The first foster home that I was in, I felt free to express myself, which I, I wasn't able to do that to the same capacity in my parents' home. It normalized me expressing myself, and I think in the moment I didn't see that, but looking back now, it had a profound impact. I've always been independent. It's just I was independent with no supports. Uh, when I was in homes, I didn't advocate for myself. I just stayed to myself. I always followed the rules. I never tried to go outside of the rules. What was heartbreaking for me was to see kids that had grown up in the system and they thought that was just a way of living. That for me really started this fire inside of me to think that children are okay with just being treated like this and they don't know any better when they clearly deserve much better. You might have one social worker one week and then the next month you have a new one or one year later you have a new one. People just want somebody who's trustworthy and is willing to stick with them, you know, no matter what. I know that a lot of kids don't like having a caseworker or anything, but at the same time I do feel like it's kind of a good thing because they're there to advocate for them, they're there to support, help support them. Just the fact that I can call them at any time of the day and I know they'll answer, they'll be able to find me resources, they'll help me with school if I need help, they'll find me a tutor, just overall help me with anything if I need help. I started going to a Bible study for college aged people and I actually met my fiance there. He's definitely been a very strong support 
in my life currently and um, in the past couple of years. Well-being for me right now is definitely having a strong support system, having healthy relationships. It all goes back to people showing that they're going to be there for you. From the moment I met you, I knew this day would come. Was that you? Oh, well, yeah, yeah, it was me. Uh, I tend to just keep the positive energy going, so me just trying to be in a good mindset. I like to box. Physical exercise kind of helps me escape or get into like my own little world. I definitely feel like my emotional and mental health for as part of my well-being is definitely much better than it used to be. I'm always going to be happy. I'm always going to be positive and stay humble because if I don't, who will? My grandmother on my mom's side, she just let me be sensitive, let me be humble, let, let me cry, let me be myself, and told me to always stay myself. And that's probably why I'm so positive. The fact of me starting college is a huge deal for me. I feel like I've, I've broken a lot of um, stereotypical barriers when it comes to the system. Being in college has opened up my mind to so many doors and I've met so many different types of people being a college student. I've also decided like I want to help everyone that I could possibly help, not only limit it to America or California, but across the world. My whole thing is I want to achieve greatness. Those are big words, but I feel like I can back it up. Great. We want to thank the young people for helping with that production and, and the Transition Funders Group for allowing us to show it. I think it's the first time it's been showed to a group, maybe? Second time? First or second? Outside of the network. Outside of the network. So it's great. It's great. Um, and I think it's a great way to kind of kick off our conversation today on policy. Um, Patrick, you know, kind of mentioned on Tuesday that, you know, it really is the young people and their voices that are really leading us in this work. And Sandra really emphasized that. It's all of our responsibility, all of our work together to kind of provide that rock solid foundation for them and to have that kind of well-being that we know is so important. The brief on the table um, is, is very much hot off the presses. We had it delivered here. So if your hands are cold from the air conditioning, you want to warm them up, just, you know, slip them into the cover. Uh, we hope that um, we can, you know, a lot of great conversations this week, right, about some of the challenges that young people face and they're working to overcome and how we can help them. Their voices are contained in this paper, as well as a number of recommendations around what normalcy means to them. Um, we hope that it's a useful tool for you um, as you make the case at the site level, um, particularly around the Strengthening Families Act, right? This is that piece of federal legislation that passed almost a, a little over a year ago, it was September of last year. Um, and so there's all kinds of great opportunities, you know, both the Strengthening Families Act, and if we reflect back seven, eight years to the Fostering Connections Act, these federal policy reforms really provide a great catalyst for us at the state level, at the site level, uh, to do really great work for young people. So we're hopeful that, uh, that you can take the brief, read it on the airplane on the way home, and think about ways that you could use it uh, back in your site. So why normalcy? Um, so why is this an important issue for us? Um, and, you know, we talked about uh, kind of the underscoring the need that young people need equitable opportunities to engage in normal adolescent experiences to, to achieve well-being. So we really try to, wanted to try to make the connection this week that well-being for young people and this concept of normalcy and, and how the Strengthening Families Act is a driver for policy change at the state level, all this work is all connected. And um, so we're excited today. Um, to kind of engage in two conversations with you. One is where uh, Nebraska and New Mexico are going to kind of share some of their early efforts, early implementation efforts uh, in their states. Um, and they're going to kind of talk about the process they're engaged uh, to drive those new state requirements in relation to the federal law, the Strengthening Families Act, um, the kind of current status of that work. And then we're going to shift to talk some about some of the successes and challenges that they've experienced that could be instructive to all of you um, and kind of their hope for, for the implementation. So we're going to have 
uh, those discussions. And then we're going to later, we'll talk a little more, and Barbara will help us um, f um, kind of lay out this World Cafe kind of conversation that we're going to have and you have in your agenda. And that will be where we can kind of really drill down more into the policy um, pieces of the Strengthening Families Act, some key pieces. Um, and hopefully, they'll be informative conversations as well. So I'm going to very just briefly go down and introduce our terrific panel. Uh, first is Doug Weinberg, and he is the director of the Division of Children and Family Services for the Nebraska Department of Health and Human Services. We have Jenny Scala, Vice President of Community Impact, Nebraska Children and Families Foundation. And then we have Marissa Vigil, Jim Casey Youth Opportunities Initiative Young Fellow and Ezra Spitzer, Executive Director of the New Mexico Child Advocacy Networks. And then we have Jennifer Delaney, District Court Judge, New Mexico, Sixth Judicial District Court. And last but not least, Jenny Pekempner, uh, and Supervising Attorney for the Juvenile Law Center. And Jenny has provided some policy-related technical assistance in both of these jurisdictions, so she thought we thought we would add her perspective to this conversation as well. So, Let's just go ahead and thank our panelists for being willing to share with us, and we'll get started. So our first question, and then we're just going to kind of go down the line here, um, and folks will share as they would like to in each question. First question for Doug is, what process are you engaged within your state to implement the new federal requirements, and what's the cur current status of that work? Well, good morning, everybody. Upon passage of the, uh, the act, about a year ago. In Nebraska, we formed a working task force. And it was much more than just another government committee. Uh, it was a very collaborative work group uh, that worked very hard to kind of develop the framework and definition for normalcy for the children and youth that we serve uh, in the state of Nebraska. Uh, it brought in voices from across the state, from a number of different disciplines. We had youth who had aged out of our foster care system. We had youth, young adults who are in our older youth foster care system, bridged to independence. Uh, we had providers, we had foster parents, we had judges, uh, we had stakeholders from across the state, including the foundation. And uh, worked very hard to help define what normalcy should look like in our foster homes across the state. So that was probably the biggest thing we did and we really took those, not just recommendations, but those ideas, those concepts, that vision. And uh, about a month and a half ago, at the end of September, uh, we published our policies and our guidelines that are now in the hands of child placing agencies and foster parents. So we begin this process of trying to create a more normal childhood uh, for the youth and children that we serve. So it's a, it's a Effort that's in progress will continue to evolve over time as we look at the successes, and uh, but I'm very encouraged by the start. Jenny? A few more details about where we're at currently then. Uh, we have a December 2nd stakeholder meeting where all of the provisions and recommendations that have been generated, not only begun implementation within the department, but also the importance of the young people and the bio parents and the foster parents to really have a voice in leading and implementation on all of these recommendations will take place, like I said, on December 2nd. It's also a time where the state legislature, um, Senator Campbell, is drafting legislation. So we're all in this together. There's been over 300 stakeholders involved from this process and the young people, again, the importance of the young people who generated even the survey questions that needed to be asked to all stakeholders, to the bio parents and the foster parents being able to have true discussions amongst each other and with the stakeholders has been incredible. All right. Um, so thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Todd. Um, so I was going to answer that question for New Mexico, and I've just realized actually that you asked me to be on the panel because my name's not Jennifer. So, <laughs> uh, so in New Mexico, where um, you know this was an issue that was um, it, our young people were really sort of out. You know, this this issue really resonated with them as that as that federal law came down. It was something that really spoke to them, and so we we sort of very early very early worked with them and. Um, 
drafted a piece of legislation, took the legislation, supported them taking that to the legislature. Um, and young people were, were really great and, uh, and, and uh, integral in that process. And, and the legislation, you know, and, and there's a longer story there that I'm, I'm happy to share, you know, later at any time. But, you know, the legislation um, was very, very well received um, at the legislature. It passed through, passed through four committees on, in both chambers without any votes against. It passed through the state senate without any votes against. But it, it never got a final vote um, and did not become law because um, it, it, it fell short on the House side. Um, but what was great from that is that it really, I think, helped demonstrate that there really was a whole lot of public will around this issue, and, and I think it really helped the department recognize um, how important this issue was and how important this issue was to young people. Uh, so after the legislative session, um, our department um, asked us to convene a group of young people to sit down and talk through how you know how can we do this between legislative sessions? How can we how can we change our administrative laws um, to to make these changes? And so that process we facilitated. We convened a group of young people through it was a four to six month process um, of really going through. And we had that wonderful legislation as a starting point for the conversation. So. We were able to go through that process, um, you know, sort of going back and forth with, with CYFD, with our department, um, and just really sort of work out what is this going to look like. And so th that process is completed. It's, it's, those laws have been promulgated. They're official. And we're now in the process of convening, continuing to convene that same group to help build those um, procedures, right? The devil's always in the details. So to help, to work with CYFD to build those details of what are the procedures going to look like that are going to that that those laws are driving. So. so I think the only the only <laughs> thing that I would add is just when I kind of look at what the partnerships need to be. Um, in, in looking at the process for moving implementation forward, that it's thinking of partnerships. And I, it sounds like you guys both, Nebraska and um, New Mexico, both did this. I have a little more experience in working with Nebraska on this, that you're looking at the partners that you need to create the content of the policy. What is the menu of, of ideal options you want? And so like examples I think you had in Nebraska was not just talking about, so we know we have to prohibit Apple under age 16. But are we going to choose to prohibit APLA for all ages? That that might be among the menu that you want partners to help you think through. And then partners that are helping you move the plan forward. And as both of, you, both of the states described, how you get there um, can take a lot of different routes. So you want to think about legislation. You want to think about regulation. You want to think about policy. And your partners for each might differ. And that is probably a good thing, that you might need some advocates that are going to have more experience with legislation. And some provider agencies that do more direct service might say, that's a good role for you, advocate. I'm going to be working um, and have more expertise on some of the agency policy. So I think what's good to think about in these partnerships is that you're going to have a lot of different people, and it's OK for them to play different roles. And in fact, you want them to do that, because we all do not just have strengths um, and challenges, but we do all come from different niches in what we do. Um, and you want to utilize all those people um, to use those. You want to utilize your judge partners to help kind of convince the judiciary. And so thinking about the varieties of partnerships, and again, I think of them in terms of how do you create the best menu of options, and that can take all your stakeholders, all your advocates, maybe some external people, people like us who do technical assistance and policy advocates who even spark, who can give you what's happening in other states to create the content, and then all the people on the ground who can help you think of strategies to get to all the places you want to go. Because everyone in this room honestly is talking about wanting to do more than basic compliance. You all are talking about wanting to maximize the law law's effect. And if you want to do that, I think you have to be thinking of all three levels, legislation, um, internal policy, and regulation, potentially. And that does take, I think, multiple plans. That's great. Let's go back to Doug, and, and let's talk a little bit more and flesh out partnerships, like the value of those, how you've kind of pulled stakeholders together, how, how young people have been engaged. 
Sure, I just want to make one comment uh, before I turn it over to Jenny. She was obviously more closely involved with this than I was. But uh, I think the one thing that was very important in Nebraska was engaging uh, the voices and the thoughts of, of young people. Uh, I can only imagine you know, the activities that I was involved with as a youth probably aren't all that hip by today's standards. So we really wanted normalcy to be seen through the eyes of young people in Nebraska. So it really was something they could relate to and, and truly benefit from. So for all the Jim Casey sites, we were asked specifically why Nebraska Children and Project Everlast were bringing together all of these stakeholders and doing this when the department was fully going into implementation and looking at all the provisions and doing what they needed to by the September 29th. And, and I just want to say to all of you, it, it's because we've been working at this for so long on these normalcy activities for young people. And, and really, it's the most exciting piece of legislation that I think Jim Casey Youth Opportunities Initiative has really been leading to get to. And uh, so if you're not a convener already, I really encourage you to be that because you can bring all of the voice, all of the partners, and all of this together so that everyone is in this paradigm shift all at the same time, as Jenny Pokepner mentioned. So I want to give a big thank you to the department for really being in partnership with us, for Jim Casey to lead the way and encourage us to be a convener in this way, and also Jenny Pokepner. If you didn't have that, if you're not taking advantage of what she all knows, or uh, Todd, um, please make sure you do, because they can give you perspective of what other states have been doing for years and where we're headed down and what could be um, really a lesson learned. Um, a little bit more about our details of the stakeholders. We had, you know, caseworkers, judges, attorneys, um, the department, staff, the private agencies, foster parents, bio parents, um, senators all working on this together. But what I found most interesting was when we went to the foster parents and bio parents and the young people to begin with, they said, okay, here's another focus group around some important things we've been talking about for a long time. Does this really have any teeth? Is it really going to make a difference? Are we really going to be able to make the change needed? And I wasn't sure at that time at the beginning. I, I, I was saying, yes, we, you need a voice in this, but I wasn't sure how much until we had an interim study um, a legislative hearing a couple weeks ago, they really mean this. The young people are leading this effort and they're listening to what is needed and, and going to pave the way. So engage them from the beginning. Like I said, they were able to then create the surveys that were then put out to the masses to create, we're in consensus in 10 provisions and recommendations of the act and those will go into legislation in some format but then there's a few more that need some more time and there's a commitment from our senators to put that in a commission to be able to have oversight and to be able to all work together into the future to make sure it's successful. I'm just going to focus on uh, how we interacted with the young people to make this happen. And in the state of New Mexico, we really just focused on sitting down with our youth uh, that we work with, which is the VIP leaders, which means Visionaries Inspiring Positive Leaders of New Mexico. And it's a youth group brought together to work on local issues in uh, our child welfare system. And we, the first, when we got addressed with this, uh, we brought it to their attention and asked them if this was something they actually really wanted to work on and if it was something that they were willing to put their effort and their time and their passion into. Um, and we had a lot of discussion back and forth, like what parts are important to us, what parts aren't, because it's a huge bill and uh, has a really, a lot of important parts. So. We sat down with our community partners, uh, Pegasus Legal Services, which work with youth. Um, and so she sat down with us and really told us the legal side of uh, what the bill was saying and uh, kind of gave us a more understanding and if we wanted to do it. And through that, we, we decided that we wanted to work on it. Uh, and we went to the legislator to testify and watching those youth go up to senators that they've never experienced that like 
talking to somebody that actually makes decisions in their life and being able to have that voice. It was really powerful to watch them grow in their own personal lives and um, be able to feel like their voice mattered. And so through that, um, we went every day for the legislator um, whenever the committee was in session. And through that, like Ezra said, it didn't pass. But so we felt a little discouraged. And at the same time, our CYFD, which is our child services, um, they were against certain parts of the bill. So when we would see them in the room when we were testifying, we kind of felt like if we not threaten, I don't know how to say it, like not threaten, but um, <laughs> kind of like discouraged because we're like, this is a great bill and you should be supporting us because like you're working with youth every day, like this is really good for them. And so through that, um, we felt a little discouraged. And then when the bill didn't pass, um, we lost a lot of youth's passion, I guess. And so through NMCAN, we were able to partner with CYFD and be able to build those relationships and have youth literally share their stories to their old caseworkers, to the people they worked with, and be able to build those relationships again and be able to trust them. And like the fact that they were willing to put, um, what is it called, like when? Well, I, think what, I think what Marissa's getting to is, you know, I think one thing that was important when that legislation was crafted was making it, making sure the legislation affirmatively expressed the right to normal experiences instead of just being reactive to the bill. And so I think that was a really central tenant in, in that piece of legislation, so I think I think in re-sitting down in that conversation with the department, it was it, we were able to start from that point. Thank you. And and I'll just add a couple other things on partnerships. I mean, the young people absolutely were the key, the primary partnership that you know they're the one that had to be there. You know, we did a lot of work. Um, we got legislative support from New Mexico Voices for Children, which does legislative work in the in the state, and we got a lot of sort of technical help from Pegasus Legal Services for Children, which is. Um, that did a lot of help with us for the bill drafting and sort of um, expert testimony. So, you know, those, those relationships are, part, are very important. I would say two things, two other things about partnerships. I think it's important, um, re read your political tea leaves very carefully. Um, that your traditional, this is a bipartisan issue, it's a big issue, it's an important issue. When young people talk about it, it's not partisan. And your traditional bill sponsors, depending on what's happening in your state, may not be the right bill sponsor. So just um, go outside of your comfort zone and finding a sponsor would be sort of the advice I would have. And the other piece I would have is really, really, really try to have that conversation about liability with the department up front and get solid on that before you move forward with the legislation because that's, that's a really tough piece. And, and if you're not there, that can kind of, can kind of unwind the process. So. things I would add is that for states or sites that are thinking about wanting to pull together a stakeholder group and which would be kind of the basis for figuring out what the partnerships are both in building content and then strategically is that you can and I know Nebraska and New Mexico are probably willing to share of kind of going down the line of who are the people that you would invite? I mean, you guys do know that, but thinking through based on their experience, you know, you need some lawyers there. I'm sorry, you, you, it's maybe self-interested, but you don't, you don't, all of you aren't gonna, like you need them to tell you, what does New Mexico current law say about liability protection? Do we need to change that? Is there coverage there already? Um, what's in our regulations already? Do we just need to amend that? So you can then be strategic about how to go about the change you want. Um, you do need, you know, all of us don't have the legislative expertise. We know we want to pass a law, but we don't, all of us, I, I need partners in our capital Harrisburg to tell us, you know, this, this um, legislative um, person is, is very um, a champion for our issues, 
but they have no authority or power. <laughs> they're not going to get this thing passed. So they're great. They're on the same page with us. But we need a sponsor who can move this bill. And I, we always need partners for that. So I think that I, I think you guys are willing to share who, who are the people that we might not necessarily think of as the people we necessarily invite to all of our meetings, but we do need to not play a role in every single phase of this process, but again, picking their places so that you don't take on everything and you really do strategically use the people in your network. And I think in doing that, you find that they're going to be useful in the future. One, you're educating them about some of these issues. I, I'm pretty sure in most of our states, the, while a lot of um, legislators know about some of these issues, talking about normalcy because it seems so why do we have a law for normalcy? W explain this to me. Like, what is the? Pr You're going to have to be explaining some of that stuff um, that is very kind of um, an, a, a recurring issue for all of us, but something that is sometimes hard for them to understand. So, figuring out kind of how you how you whether that's communication or getting partners that can help you um, make that case and and describe it in a way that is going to be compelling to them, I think is uh, you can really learn because I feel like you both of your, your states have really utilized like every resource and partner <laughs> in your state, whether it's Appleseed, the Child Advocacy Network, to really pull on attorneys um, to figure out how they can be partners to move the you guys to the goal. That's great. All kinds of good strategic advice there um, related to partnerships and government affairs and things. That's, that's fantastic. Let's turn to some just lessons learned, successes, challenges, that you think would be instructive to other sites in trying to work towards effective implementation of the law? Sure. I'll, I'll focus on some of the challenges and let Jenny talk about its successes. Um, this is really much more than just you know, passing state legislation, addressing liability issues. I think what we're talking about here is a shift in culture, really a cultural change. Moving away from one that focuses on risk management, safety, to one that focuses on normalcy. And for a lot of people, for a lot of stakeholders, it's a tough, tough change. So it's very important to engage foster parents, child placing agencies, and even our own case managers, because they are so used to an environment of saying no. You're looking at safety, not wanting to take a risk. And you know, unless we begin to move down that cultural change, we'll never see the success out of SFA that we all want to have happen. So it's very, very important uh, to embrace those stakeholders, bring them along slowly if necessary, because you've really got them, you really have to get them comfortable with the issue of risk. And to me, it's, it's more than just laws, it's about trust. And sometimes it takes a long time to, to build that trust, you know, given the history we've had that's so focused on safety and, and often saying no. So number one, please be patient, uh, because it's going to take time. You know, you'll have some foster parents that are right there, all ready to go. You'll have others that are downright nervous. So it will take time, work with them, uh, but don't ever give up because this is something definitely worth fighting for. Um, I think within New Mexico you've heard some of our successes and challenges with regard to um, getting legislation um, <clears throat> getting legislation passed and working with CYFD. One of our, our next steps, which is a challenge that um, we sort of fully realized in preparing for today, is that the judiciary is not on board yet in New Mexico. And so we are talking about the steps that we need to take to make sure that the judiciary is on board. I mean, the, the implementing the normalcy provisions is something that I've been doing in my court with children before we were really allowed to talk about normalcy because I realized the effect as a foster parent, guardian ad litem, um, <clears throat> that the lack of normalcy was having on all of these children. And so what I make sure that I do in my courtroom, which isn't happening in courtrooms around the state, which isn't happening in courtrooms around the country, is sitting down and talking with the kids without anybody else in the room on multiple times, every hearing, to see what's going on, what are your needs that aren't being met, what can we do for you. And there's also cultural competency that we have to take into consideration with regard to prudent parenting and explaining that to foster parents as well, and whether that's through the courtroom setting or not. When I was a guardian ad litem, I had two children that were Jehovah Witnesses that don't celebrate any holidays. They were put in a Christian home where they were excited about Santa coming. And I just thought, what's going to happen to these kids when they go home 
and they go back to Santa's not coming. You know, I mean, it's, it's, we have to understand on all levels that being a prudent foster parent isn't being the same as the parent you would be to your child. It is what this specific child in this home needs for them. I had another foster parent recently who was um, talking about in court how she was trying so hard to get this teenage boy into football and he was just resisting at every step of the way and she, all of her kids were in sports. He needed to do football. Well, when I sat down and talked with him, he hated football. He loved basketball. He was more than willing to do basketball, but he wasn't going to do football. And so there really has to be a recognition and, and a concerted effort by the courts to make sure that the right questions are being asked and that these children are being talked to. And the only way to make sure that's happening is that if you have all the judges on board. Every judge in New Mexico got a bench card that they can take on the bench with them that says, here's the questions that you ask. But I have 34 bench cards for all the different kinds of cases that I have. And if I have the time to go through them, the right bench card gets put on top. Um, and so one of the things that we as co-chairs of our children's Court Improvement Commission are going to take on is educating the judges about the questions in New Mexico that they need to be asking to make sure that everybody's doing their job. So that's our next challenge. That's great. Just to talk a little bit about success and challenges in the same vein here, the success of what Jenny Pokepner was talking about right now, Nebraska Appleseed, Sarah Helvey, for who's involved with Spark, she's back home educating all the judges right now and so again it's everyone's playing their part and again if anyone wants our tools here's a whole um, report and all the surveys and all the things we've taken from other states but also the ones we generated please know that they they're shared and can be utilized but it has been um, success in all of, of those aspects the challenges still before us are all the things that we've already been discussed in the considerations that need to go forward around one of the recommendations that everyone's in consensus with is that every young person touched by any system juvenile justice mental health behavioral health foster care deserves normalcy and who doesn't agree with that right we all know that but we have a very unstable specific juvenile justice and mental health system right now. And so if we go forward and put that in legislation right now, could it cause more harm than <laughs> good at this moment? We don't know. And I think it's really um, something we need to decide in the next couple of weeks. So it is having these de heartful discussions and, and truthful of where everybody's at to be able to implement this correctly. Um, the other thing I just saw on a success point is DHHS could have again done this all on their own and um, from the very beginning when Appleseed and um, our, our organization came together and said let's convene all the stakeholders, DHHS stepped right in and said okay, we'll share with you, we'll be very transparent on everything we're considering, everything we're doing. So if you can have that kind of relationship with all of the stakeholders and on building all that trust, it really has led the way to, I hope, very successful implementation. The only just other quick thing, I, I think one of the biggest challenges all of us face is like the, the challenge between doing things quickly to meet these timelines and doing them well. And I don't think that those things are mutually exclusive, but I think it is that we have to be mindful that states are turning in or have turned in amendments to their 4E plans that they that are saying they're in compliance with the law. So first thing is we need to know what's been submitted in our states. And I think all of you guys probably are, have, have, have that information because you're already working these collaborations. But then get some commitments with even though you did need to meet these timelines to amend your plans, what are our next steps? So having kind of plans that really relate to what's been submitted and how is that, that plan implemented? How are you telling the feds you're going to meet these 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 deadlines and these requirements and what is our more long-term 
steps and they might be legislation they may not be so I, I'm not saying that it has to be I think there's definitely some benefits and some provisions that you really do want in law because you want them to have a strong basis and an anchor and an enforcement mechanism but you do need I think policy at all three of these levels because all of the things that I think everyone said on the panel and you guys know is that if this is such a big sea change it does require change from top to bottom and that does mean law that impacts court practice um, regular Regulations that impact licensing um, and internal guidance that impacts what caseworkers do. So you need all three. You may not get all three um, by the end of this year, but that doesn't mean you don't want to kind of have your short-term and long-term plans. That's great. Well, um, we have one more question, and so I'm excited that we can open this up for questions that you may have. And so go ahead and start thinking if you have a question or two. I think we'll have time for two or three questions from the group. Um, but before we do that, kind of the last question for the panel is, what's your biggest hope? You know, as we think about eff effective implementation of this, what does it look like? What's your vision or hope of how we can shift the system? And Doug, you kind of already spoke a little bit about this culture change and the culture of no and how we want to shift, but what are those big shifts, big picture things that we'd like to see two, three, four years down the road? Sure. Well, I think, you know, my vision is probably one that we all share, is that, uh, you know, for the children and youth we serve, whether in the system for a month, a year, or longer, that they all experience those same life events that we did, that we, many of us did growing up, whether it be a prom, that first sleepover, going to band camp, whatever. Because that's part of growing up. And as we learned yesterday, uh, it's really through these activities that healing happens. Definitely on the theme of this conference, the equity and the well-being will be there through this. And I just want to thank the, this convening because we've been able to have conversations about the youth involvement again in the Youth Bill of Rights. It was already established within the department, but it's going to be revisited now. The youth being involved in the grievance process instead of it being just in the court system because that's not normal necessarily. Um, but the youth really having peer-to-peer -peer supports for that. We've been able to talk about the teen or the young parent and what their rights look like in the SFA so again these conversations at every point is going to get to the equity and and well-being so thank you so I think I think one of the you know as as this Jenny said um, <laughs> you can do right you can implement it just to the bare bones or you can implement it right and I think I think what's so great about this legislation is if it's done right you know it it can be a tool, really, I think, for shifting cultures with how departments interact with their foster parents, stressing that parent piece, and, and the way departments and foster parents interact with the kids that have been entrusted to their care. And I, I just think that if you do it right, that's so important, and it can lead to those normalized experiences. And if you do it with race and equity as the center of that, we can, we can really have a sort of culture shift that can make things possible, hopefully. And, and along that line, more conversations between foster parents and bio parents about what is truly normal for those children that are in custody. What is the right thing for them? Um, and I think that that will lead to better outcomes for our kids. I do try to agree with everyone mm -hmm. on uh, that, it, that it, we think it will, that it should lead to better outcomes. I think particularly around, I mean, everyone's, when we're talking about normalcy, we are talking about permanency, and just seeing the degree to which implementing this in a comprehensive way gives youth more opportunities to make connections. And also, as, as you pointed out, you know, if we involve the family, the biological family, not just the parents in these decisions, even decisions that we don't have to, um, we're really encouraging people either to co-parent or to facilitate potentially reunification or at least a, a more full support system that's really strong around the youth. So that would be my hope. And the other hope would just be that you all use each other because there's so many great ideas and so many states are already have done these really great partnerships. And everyone's been really willing to share. What is your attendee list? Who are you inviting? Who are they? What, you know, what, what roles do they play? 
what was your agenda for the meeting? What issues? I think everyone's willing to share. You don't need to start from scratch. And it's not that you have to use everything that everyone does, but you use that, you critique it, you edit it, you make it yours, and you don't have, and I think it brings out a better, a better product. That's great. Okay, we're gonna turn a mic over here to Victoria. And uh, anyone have a question or two for the panel? Hi, I have a question for Ezra. Um, so you talked a little bit about the policy process and the champions and that sometimes your key champions aren't the right people. I'm assuming that you mean they, they maybe didn't have the political power to get the bill through, but, and if not, correct me. And then is there anything just in the language specifically that you would say, you know, looking back, we would have drafted it a little bit differently and changed this or changed that. What were the really hot button issues um, with the legislation? Yeah, so um, just to to um, just to give a little more context around what happened. Yeah, so um, you know, New Mexico for a long time has had a democratically controlled House and Senate, um, and sort of between the time we started working with this bill and a sponsor. And the session, the, the House of Representatives changed to uh, Republican leadership. Um, and we have a Republican executive. And while that also happened, our bill sponsor, who, would, who has, was a former foster, he was a former foster youth, he cares a lot about the issue, but he also has that personal relationship with it. He also came into a position of power in the state Senate. Um, and so sort of as political point scoring at the end of the process, all his bills were held for a vote on the Republican, in the Republican House. So, so um, this bill was one of his bills. Um, so that was sort of, sort of the, he didn't have the power, but in some ways he had too much power. Um, so, so just, you know, those are the things that happen, and it's sort of a perfect example of adults failing young people, but um, that's what we do. So, um, <laughs> You know, in terms of the of the legislation itself, I would say you know the 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 biggest issue in ours was actually around the the liability piece, and I and I think what's difficult for states is the liability piece in one way sounds easy, but what it does is it exposes other liability concerns that may already be existent in your state. So in New Mexico, for instance, we have a Tort Claims Act, but it has its own problems and its own functions, and its own you know it. It needs to be fixed, I think a lot of people think. And so when you come with a bill that begins to interact with that, you have, you don't necessarily have a simple solution because a lot of people say, well, we should just fix the Tort Claims Act and then this will solve itself. So that liability piece is really complicated and I think depends on what's happening in your state as well. On the legislation piece, you know, we felt it was very, very important to that the legislation expressed an affirmative right to normal activities and that everything flowed from that. Um, I think where you can get in the weeds is start getting really prescriptive about the types of things that are allowed. You know, that what we, we kind of were with the less is more. We didn't, we didn't want to prescribe everything that like these are the types of activities. We wanted to give some examples. But you know, legislators can kind of get you know, they can get a little confused when they start seeing that stuff in there or start thinking of crazy examples. So, you know, <laughs> we would definitely caution to not being overly prescriptive, but trying to get at the heart of it, but giving enough examples. And really for us, the main thing was young people telling the story, right? Getting young people there who weren't allowed to go to band camp, getting young people there who weren't allowed to go to church camp. Those are issues that the minute legislators hear them, it's like they're done, they're finished hearing it in committee and they're ready to pass that bill out. So I think those are the big issues and making sure that, you know, if your state doesn't codify a bill of rights in code, take that opportunity and try to get it in there. Yep, good, Jenny. Um, a lot of a, a lot of times the issue is raised of how does this impact biological parents' rights, and I think you have to just be prepared that um, 
if people misunderstand what this law is intending to do, they might think that it is encroaching on parents' rights. So I know that we in Pennsylvania, and I think several other states have talked about how they've had to explain what kinds of decisions this applies to and what kinds of decisions it does not apply to because parents still retain certain legal rights. So that's an issue that, again, when I said some of this is about explaining what it is and the parameters, what it includes, what it doesn't include. I think everyone has to be ready to have this discussion, which you might have been indicating, about hypothetical activities that are rarely, youth rarely engage in, but might, um, but things that might involve dangerous either weapons or <laughs> things that, you know, we say wheels and weapons, things that involve things that make any adult nervous that a young person might be involved in. And I think you just have to be ready for how does your policy account for that? Is it just a straight out? We want um, caregivers to think about what they would allow for, like you said, either their kid or a young person in their care, or do you want to kind of have a sense of are there certain activities that we really say maybe there needs to be more discussion about? Those aren't things I would lead with, but those are the kinds of things I think, because I'm sure you guys did have these hypotheticals of like, what if they want to do um, tightrope walking? Should we have a policy on that? No, you don't want to have a policy on that, but you know someone's going to throw something like that out. Um, so those, and I think, you know, through working with states, and again, this is why we want everyone to talk to each other, is we're starting to see what are those things, the things that are both legitimate things that people are raising, and the ones that, it's not that they're not legitimate, but they're ones that really are a result of not understanding what this covers and what it doesn't. So those are the two that have come up, I think, re are recurrent and really can be explained when, when you have, um, when, you're, when you're ready. The other thing is whenever we use rights language in laws, some some legislators really don't like that for kids. We're always going to fight for it, but you should know that you might have to have a discussion of, well, what does that mean? Does that mean they can sue us? And those tend to be, again, another hot button issue, but I think you can discuss that and come up with what's your strategy if, you, if it's important to you to use that kind of language. Um, always talk about the bill on its merits. We made a mistake early on, we recovered from it, but don't talk about it as this is something the feds are requiring or we could lose $40. That's a mistake, right? Talk about it on its merits and, and don't go that route. That's great advice. All right, I think we've, <laughs> we're very smart. Uh, I think we have time for just one more question, quick response, go ahead, Sid. Well, I have two questions actually. Okay. Uh, but I'll try to make them quick. That's fine. Uh, first, some of the activities you discuss, like going to camp, going to prom, have fiscal costs associated with them. So I wonder if any of you have thought about whether uh, this legislation has or should have a fiscal note and how you deal with that when those costs arise. And then second, and relatedly, how do you assess the success of implementation? How do you ensure that there's some accountability and how do you determine whether or not kids are really having more normal childhoods? again here at the convening a little bit about the extra cost and and where even to have this further discussion we do believe there needs to be something available for last resort but we're also building that real community collaborative to address all this too so each community should be able to look at what's available for young people and try to access it and then really look at a public-private partnership for what the department would have available and also what the private philanthropy and, and partners in the community would be able to access. Yeah, I mean, we're looking administratively at the possibility of having a special allowance for certain situations, but that's in the formative stages of discussion, but it's something we'll definitely take a look at. And then on the accountability piece is the senators have agreed to, like I was mentioning before, put a commission together, appointed commission committee to be able to have that oversight to ensure that there is actual effective implementation and normalcy is being achieved. So that's one strategy we're working on. Yeah, I think in, in terms of the budget piece, you know, it, didn't, it never became a big issue for us, um, you know, COFD, our COFD does have some funds for those things. You know, we have some community partners that'll that'll pay those things, friends of foster children, that'll that'll pay for those types of things. It fortunately never really, for us and the whole piece of it, it's never it's never been a concern that's really slowed it down. Um, on the accountability piece, I mean, I think in, in the way that legislation can be drafted too, I think the courts play a big role in that. I think there should be, I think there should has to be a mechanism 
by which the courts are looking to see, hey, one right a child has is normalcy. Are those rights being provided? And maybe, Jennifer, you have. Right, and I think it goes back to judges asking the right questions to make sure that the normalcy provisions are being um, implemented and are being met and making sure that every child has the opportunity to do all of the things that the normalcy provisions allow them to do that they couldn't do before. Um, uh, other than judicial accountability, I don't know what mechanisms, if any, have been put in place. I'm hoping that CYFD, if they don't already after this, um, will have a process for evaluating what their offices are doing to make sure that it's being implemented statewide. If I could add one more comment on accountability. Uh, we have uh, stakeholder surveys uh, that we uh, publish and produce on a regular basis. They include young people in foster care. So we've already started talking about how do we want to change our questions on our survey so we can get their feedback you know, on whether or not this is being effective. Under the law, they do require court oversight for normalcy, but only the requirement is for youth with the goal of AFLA. And most of the states that I've talked to have said that makes no sense to just limit it to youth with AFLA. We should be having judicial findings about normalcy for all youth. So that's definitely, you know, if, if I had could write your wish list, it would be making sure that in your statute that there is judicial oversight because that's going to that's gonna be reflected in a court form with a box or something where there has to be some, some response. And ideally, with a good judge, it's a discussion. Um, but at least it's documentation of requirement that that question is being asked and something's being put in there. The other thing to think about in terms of accountability is that you guys all do have grievance policies that um, are in place. Your agencies have to under, under Title IV-E for all types of benefits or planning that are that is provided under the Social Security Act. Usually we see parents taking advantage of that and not necessarily youth, but youth are among the people who can grieve um, in, in terms of any kind of benefit or service that's provided by the agency. And so you might want to think about what those policies look like in terms of not just normalcy, but other things, particularly as you're looking at your requirement to have that Bill of Rights, because that Bill of Rights is an opportunity to not just explain about rights, but also the right to file a grievance and then think among your partners what is an actually youth-friendly, youth-accessible grievance policy? Because in my state, we have a grievance policy. I've never seen or heard. I ask advocates and youth all the time, do you know about it? Have you ever used it? N none of them have used it. So it's not effective. But again, we have these opportunities with several of the provisions in the law to say, what would that look like? Not because we want everyone to be unhappy and file a grievance, but we want there to be mechanisms that really work. So when things don't work, there is a feedback loop. In addition to surveys, that you guys are doing in Nebraska, surveys that they're doing in Missouri, so other ways to get that feedback that, that really can help you figure out how you're doing. That's great. Let's thank our panel. <clears throat>